I'd like to thank you all for coming out to the second presentation in the series of three that I'm doing for this exhibit. Um, the initial one, for those of you who weren't here, was uh, Kate McGurk from the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum and Library came and did a, uh, a great presentation, which you can see on my website on nextcomics.com, about the history of Ohio comics, um, going all the way back to, uh, to, to the greats like Windsor McKay and, 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 and the cult. Um, who invented the yellow kid, which interestingly feeds into our discussion today a little bit. It does. Uh, it's nice. uh, today is about a slice of, that was about the past of Ohio comics. Today is a slice of the present where I want to show people that um, who's creating comics and why they're creating comics may not necessarily be what you think. Um, was the, my idea behind it. Like I said, I kind of just let Victor go, so we'll see what his idea behind it is. But, uh, uh, so that, that's about the, the past and the present, and then uh, next Friday, or this coming Friday at 7 o'clock, Dirk will be here to be talk about the style of uh, uh, journalism he used in writing his bestseller, My Friend Dahmer, and how you can use those techniques um, when creating comic books. And so that's, uh, you got it, the future, kind of how comics can branch out from where they're at today into being something else and something different. So again, these are merely a, these are merely a slice of what can, what what comics are about. But uh, I'm hoping it's enough to whet every other appetite and have them move in on a little bit more. Um, a quick word about the Ohio Art League, who allowed me to curate this exhibit. I'd like to thank them uh, for use of their space. They've uh, been very generous, and they've asked me to uh, remind people that this is a great organization that's membership driven. Uh, I think memberships for students start at $25 for the year. Mine was 50 bucks, and every month I've gotten new and uh, interesting proposals from the Art League and, and, and opportunities from the Art League as an artist for things you can do in the community. So uh, I've already gotten my 50 bucks out of my membership this year, and I think, I think it's a great organization that people should support. Um, I think that's it. I would like to encourage everybody to take a look at the comics in the pop-up shop and pay for them on the counter at the counter on your way out. Um, buy, a lot of them. buy a lot of them. Every comic you buy supports both the art league and the artists who created them. So, so it's a it's a important part in my mind of this whole existence. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Victor Dandridge, who I met at Jeff Harper's Comic Fair um, shortly after I published my first issue. And, and, and uh, he gave me the sage advice, don't come to these things. <laughs> um, and I knew right then that, that this guy was going to be a good friend and uh, that, that he uh, had a unique perspective that was worth listening to. So uh, I'll hand it off to Victor, who will introduce, introduce you to the panelists, and we'll get going on this. Thank you, Ken. Much appreciated. Um, my name is Victor Dandridge. I'm a uh, Columbus native, um, so being a part of this is very, very important to me. Um, I hand selected some of the, the panelists here that you have uh, before you um, with my different experiences in the comic book scene and things like that. I thought um, a lot of these guys represent some, some great ideas for what we're going to talk about specifically with diversity in comics in Columbus. Um, just a little bit about myself, and I'm going to pass it on to everyone to introduce themselves. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm born and raised here. Um, I'm a self-publisher. Uh, I do it full-time, which is not very common in the, in the small press world. Um, I've been very fortunate with that. Uh, my company is Advantage In-House Productions. Um, I have about six or seven titles under my imprint, as well as a product line that uses um, comic books to teach educational ideas. I'm um, called You Create Comics, so it's something I do through schools, libraries, and things like that. Um, and that's actually how I got to meet the first person here to my left, uh, Miss Coffee. Um, if you would. Sure. Yes, yeah. please. Okay. Uh, Janice Coffee. Um, I work at Columbus City Schools. Champion Middle School is uh, where I'm at currently. And uh, all the artwork and all of the comics that I do are classroom based. I don't actually like publish out. I actually do it for my classroom. Um, and I, yeah, I found there was a need for it, and it's a, it's a great area. I do uh, Mr. I Didn't Do It. I do um, different comics like, for different things that we're learning. So that's how we met. Yes. Because there's a, there's a great need. That's right. In the classroom. And uh, going on to you know more collegiate ideas, the, the next two panelists I met when I attended a CCAD. Um, go for Mr. Mike Watson first. All right, well, <clears throat> my name is Mike Watson, uh, independent publisher, 
same with Mr. Victor, uh, except he does writing and art, right. I do solely art. <laughs> <laughs> make it sound bad. Well, not. I just, I'm not that good at the writing aspect. Um, but I have my own company called Freestyle Comics that is branched off into two different studios. Uh, FS Media, which I do graphic design and photography, and Flipside Reviews, where I do reviews on pop culture, video games, comics and movies, and that type of thing. Um, but my heart and soul is in the comic books. Uh, self publishes book, it's on its seventh issue right now, it's called Hot Shot. Uh, I was born in Cleveland, I went to the Cleveland School of Arts, uh, got a scholarship, then went down here to Columbus to attend Columbus College of Art and Design. We fed so we never left. <laughs> and then we have Ren McKenzie. Come on, stand up. Don't be that guy. <laughs> Tell us how much you love Columbus. <laughs> yeah, so I am Ren McKenzie, uh, originally from the East Coast. Oh, I'll say, say where you're from. You know you do it all the time. I was born in North Carolina. I was raised in Virginia. Um, I went to uh, the Army for 10 years. Went to CCAD. I met these uh, gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, and I, I do art. I, I draw. I do uh, uh, all kinds of freelance work, uh, pinups and things of that nature. And uh, I love doing comic books. <laughs> <laughs> now, unfortunately, I just met our uh, last panelist. Why is that unfortunate? Because I just <laughs> met. Because I'm sure that you are a, a treasure to know, and I'm feeling very, 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 you know like a, a shortcoming here that I just met you um, last week. Um, but this is Teresa Rojas, if you will. Yes, and so I guess I'll say that also. Um, so I am a PhD student at Ohio State in the English department, and I work on narrative theory, which to make it sound much less boring is about storytelling. And I specialize in Latino literature and um, visual media across, or excuse me, visual culture across media and I have a particular interest in film and television and comics, so I use a lot of comics in the classroom. And the way I got into comics creating is that there was a call for um, art. Uh, I'm actually a, a painter, I, I work in acrylics normally. And the gallery next door had a call for pieces for work on or from children of immigrants. And so I got like 60 people forwarding me this this call, and I hadn't really thought of myself as a child of immigrants, but my, my dad is from Mexico, and my mom is from Texas, and my grandparents are all from Mexico. And so when I got this call, I thought, oh, I guess I am a child of immigrants. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, I'll buy that. And the, uh, the idea that stood out for me was being very young and translating for my family, not for my mom, but for my, my step-parents and for my grandparents. And um, just being in that moment of, I don't know how to say that, I don't know what that means, but I'm gonna call it this. And so I turned that, I thought, well, there's some really funny stuff there, so I, I turned it into a, a comic, and I submitted it to the Swing Space Gallery, and they, they were very excited about it, and they, they accepted it for the exhibit. Um, so it was on exhibit, my comic was on exhibit for, and during that time. Um, and then it kind of opened up a, a lot of other ideas and I was sketching that, of course, as a graduate student, you know, who has time for that. Um, I tried to convince my committee to let me do my dissertation in comic form and they were like, you will be here for years, so you can't do that. Um, but I got the opportunity to take on the editorship of a magazine called Que Pasa OSU and this is my first semester as editor of Que Pasa and so I advocated for a color in the center of the classroom. I have some examples here. I got to interview with you. <laughs> um, and so as the editor, and since we had color, I went, guess what we're putting in the magazine? <laughs> My comic. <laughs> so this just came out, and it's available. I have a few copies, but it's also available electronically. And so, yeah, so this has been the start of something um, really interesting, and I'm really happy to be here. Well, thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, so the idea here is about diversity. Some of this kind of sparked from the uh, comic symposium that was held at CCAD last year. Um, and there was a lack of minority voices um, to be heard there. And it kind of sparked from there as, as this is an opportunity to bring in some of those 
um, ideas or those creators and things like that. But um, in the midst of it all, I think that there's even more ground that we can cover, not just on the, the simple ideas of uh, diversity. But to kick everything off, that's kind of where I want to um, give each of you guys the opportunity to answer that question, if you can, in about five minutes or so. What is diversity to you? Go for it. <laughs> I heard you with the breath. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, the diversity for me is a variety. Um, different flavors, different mixtures, um, being available to be viewed, seen, experienced, read, watched. Um, not the same, not the same color consistently over and over again, the same spill being given to you, but a variety of ideas, concepts, people, and culture. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's what you was that a Mine, <clears throat> mine is strictly artistically. Um, for me, for the past few years, and you know this for sure, right? Um, I I can become stagnant with my art if 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 I do the same style or or or, or what is conceived as a style. Um, I become angry with myself. I, I feel as if I'm not getting any better. So I, I go out and I explore other avenues, other other different techniques, um, and try them out and see if it'll work with what I've already gained. Okay, so like for that, you, that's so diversity, diversity is like it's, a... It's, it's, it's just an exploration of of, okay. of what my limitations might be. I don't like that. And, and trying to, trying to, you know... And you personalize them. diversity, like that's pretty good. Like most people don't do that, it's more about everything else, but that's, that's very internal, I like that. I like that. Any, any, well, so for me, I, it depends on the venue, right? Okay. So, <laughs> I often find myself on a panel or, or in the, at the night house <clears throat> uh, as the only person of, of color, you know, so sort of representative of the entire universe of <laughs> diversity. And so I get asked, oh, you're with that, because I'm, I'm actually the uh, humanities diversity fellow over at the night house. So it's a, I'm not going to say more about that right now. But anyway. <laughs> So um, in this context, for me, it's, it's, it's really twofold. It's about um, exactly what you were saying in that there's the artistic diversity, right? So where you see different styles, different um, kinds of people in comics, um, different ideas coming through, and different kinds of stories. So for me, um, it's really important that well, I'm really interested in life writing, so life narrative. So I really like comics that are about people's uh, stories of lived life, right? But that's like my special interest. But it's also for me about who is making them, and um, I'm really really interested in the different the different ages and the different um, ethnicities and nationalities. And so I'm originally from San Francisco. And I've been here for about 15 years, and so I, I miss some of that from San Francisco, but I think that the Midwest is perceived as much more monolithic than it is. Uh, the Midwest, particularly Columbus, before I was here I was in Ann Arbor, don't judge me, I love Ann Arbor. <laughs> and and, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's a lot more diverse than people realize. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in those sort of different perspectives on it. For me, diversity is changing constantly. Um, I think that I got married over the summer, and my one, thank you, that's coffee deal. Yeah. Oh, right? I'm a coffee deal. Um, but actually, for me, it's, it's just so ever-changing, especially being in the classroom, it's changing. Um, most of the children that I'm teaching, they're different than I am. So I'm, you know, even when I'm hitting different subject matters or storylines, I'm constantly trying to represent all the time. When I got married, uh, my stepdaughter is disabled, um, extremely disabled. So that just opened up a whole other area of diversity for me. And I, and I noticed that, you know, when I'm also not just writing and, and drawing, I'm also out there experiencing literature with the children. It is hard to find those types of, you know, like your handicap and that type of thing. And it, and it just never had dawned on me as diversity before, and it now does. Okay. Um, but diversity is just everyone, every human being being represented. 
I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, for myself, um, that is very similar to how I view diversity, is um, the, the variations of everyone as they still overlap. Because um, I think that there are some things that are very common amongst us all, but the little ways that we stand out is what defines us as diverse. Um, do you guys feel that the American comic book industry today, um, or even in the past, typifies what you feel is diverse? Do you feel like they've done? Yes. No. No. That's <laughs> <laughs> cool. I respect e Even that. as the editor of Marvel Comics is now a Latino writer, which is fabulous, mm -hmm. and that's that's a step I think in the right direction. But overall, no, absolutely not. Okay. You guys want to throw in and I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> I think now in, in, in the age we are, um, comics are attempting to remedy that by bombarding us with different cultures. You know, in the in the past what five, six, seven years in mainstream comics and, and possibly underground comics. Um, you've seen an extreme explosion of black characters, Latin characters, Asian characters, um, Arabic characters now. Um, I think many, many times I, I, I think it's good for certain people, but I think it's just too much too soon um, for, for you to change icons in, in that genre. Uh, especially ones that are household names, uh, even as a minority, uh, maybe a bit much, in my opinion. Uh, it's 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 a culture shock. It, it's it just makes you feel as if it's all about that company getting money. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, yeah. and, and Hold on to that thought because we don't. That's a, that's another question. All right. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk to you. Coffee. Well, I know that um, for me, it is really hard to find um, the diversity, especially um, when I want to maybe get something across to, uh, in where I have children reading. And I have had so many kids start reading because of comic books and graphic novels. Um, but I learned real quick, real fast, I had to check things like, you know, especially how it represents um, females. You know, uh, you can't. I can't throw one out there and you just can't dump them out there you know when you're teaching middle school mm -hmm. if things are you know and I, and I noticed wow it's hard sometimes to find women represented like women um, or you mean that as opposed to like objects yes right yeah. you know and and I get it I get it every the the whole hourglass figure but I know like with some of my females that are reading for example um, you know, and they, they want to be superheroes too. You know, that's one of the, I created Super Reading Teacher. You know, and it, you know, I dressed like her because I wanted her to be different. But um, it, it, I don't see a lot of that, um, and and I don't see a lot of. But I'm not, you know, I'm not saying don't change. You know, your Superman, your your Spider Man. The kids still love them, but you know, let's get some. Yeah, interactions and different topics and stuff, and that's kind of what I do in the classroom. I'm not out there to publish for the public, and I'm for inside the education. At least that's where I'm at right now. And that's what I have to do. So, but yeah, I'm, I struggle with that when I'm bringing it into literature or literacy. Uh, I would agree that no, there's a lot of diversity in comic books. Uh, one of the biggest changes um, Marvel Comics did in recent years was they made Spider-Man black and have half black, half Latino, which uh, is I personally think is one of their most successful ventures. Um, that book is really good. That character is really a creative, fun character, and but I feel like the only reason it's acceptable, um, I imagine you're all comic book fans, is because this Spider-Man exists in an alternate dimension. It's not. It's not the Peter Parker that's been out for 40 or 50 years. It's it's a brand new Parker that was uh, released during the whole Spider-Man movie trilogy. Um, and I think the way that they, to channel what Brent said, um, how they introduced the character, I think the way they introduced the character was very great. Uh, they actually, Peter Parker went out in a blaze of glory, uh, trying to save the <laughs> trying to save his Aunt May and stuff. Um, he had like a hundred or so issues before they introduced this character. 
um, the way they tagged in the origin stuff, I thought was really well done. Uh, you notice, again, the chime on Rain, like, uh, I noticed uh, the, maybe it was, I can't remember if she was X-Men, but they just recently, uh, North Star, he's, he's gay, and he just got married at the X-Men matches, so that was like a really big event at Marvel Comics. So some of the stuff you, you see that they're doing is kind of like, well, Marvel, are you doing this to open yourself up to your to these new fans that you're having, or are you doing this just to fit the status quo? Um, to make sure you're like, well, we have this type of book for this person. Is there any real meaning behind it? Um, at with my studio at Freestyle Comics, one of my things is when I read these comic books, as you said, I love Spider-Man. Um, we're in the jacket right now. Uh, I love all these superheroes. I grew up with them. But the one thing that always nagged me was, I'm sorry, I didn't see anybody that looked like me. I didn't see anybody that looked like me that's doing these great feats. And I always been wondering, it's like, why can't a person that looks like me or a Latino or Asian do these same things? I mean, you have these fabulous writers, you have these fabulous artists. If you put the stock into them, into these other characters, I'm sure you can make a, a hit. So um, when I started writing my, making my book, um, I wanted to see me. So I wanted to see someone like me. I wanted to show kids and comic fans that anybody can be a superhero. It's what really matters is your commitment. What kind of hero are you going to be? Are you going to be a villain or are you going to be a superhero? The outside of your skin color, the size, the frame, the hourglass figure, or whether you're 300 pounds doesn't matter. Uh, at Freestyle Comics, we have all we have all those type of characters. Uh, our recent ad campaign was recently like it was uh, like I take a picture of a kid reading the comic book. It wouldn't matter what that kid looked like, but at the bottom of it, I am Hotshot or I am Vigilance um, because when you read these books, you relate to these people because they're genuine people. You can read that story, like, man, that. That happened to me. Like, I experienced that. I know what that's like. And I agree with you 100% about the female in comic books. I don't feel like I feel she's treated as a sex object all the time. Um, well, maybe not all the time. They are starting to, like, really look in and dig into the character and try to make that female a strong, powerful woman, um, which is what I want to focus on, one of my characters. Superman in my universe, she's vigilant, but she's also black. She's just, I, Maybe I'm, you know, a little fan favorite the Chief Texas. Um, but she's a powerful female in that role. She has a she has a very respectful presence, like her skin's not all out, she's not all overexposed. Um, but she's powerful. She uh, she's something that other females or young girls can look up to and say, Oh man, I wanna be that character for Halloween, that type of thing. Uh, so now you guys definitely hit the uh, the ethnic part, um, for sure. Um, we did kind of talk about the differences of styles that exist. Do you feel like there are other styles that are represented in the American comic book system or that they are pretty flat across the board in what they showcase as these are American comics? Main? Sure. <laughs> um, as far as mainstream comics, I, I, I feel like um, they, they cater to fan service. If, if if you have 12 issues on a shelf in, in, in a month and six of those issues are by the same artist, there's no style difference, right? You know, there, there's no change in, 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 in anything. So your, your, real, your real choice in that instance is do I buy all six of these because I love this artist? Or do I try one of these from an artist I don't know and and see if if the story's right? Me personally, I won't read a book. <laughs> I, 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 I just cannot read a book if I don't like the artwork. Or or if, if if I can't understand the flow of the story. The art is the most important thing for me. I've got books I've had since I was a, a teenager. I've never read them. Wow. I've never read them. I'll look at the pictures over and over. I will not read the words. Okay. Anyone else? Is that kind of a congruent thought across the board? Yeah, I don't know enough about like, mainstream comics. You know, I, I, I can say that in, so when I teach, I, I, I've taught um, first year and second year writing that I try to bring, not only do I always have at least one Latino author um, when I have my students read comics, but I try to bring in a variety of styles so that we can talk about that. And we can talk about um, some of what Ren's getting at, and that is that, that visual 
impact that it has. So we just read, in the class I'm teaching now, we just read um, Espinosa's Rocketo, and we talked a lot about how, because his lines are very open, he's got very swooshy open lines, and they noticed that right away. And I said, well, how is that different from some of the other stuff we've read um, that's you know, more boxed in? And, and they notice all of that, and they don't always know how to articulate it, but I think it's really, really important to you know, bring that out and to ask about it. And I think there's a lot of variety out there I don't know if there's a lot of variety in mainstream comics. I just don't know enough about it. But I think that um, there's more coming out, you know. But you have to be willing to like to go and to open it, it up, and, right. yeah, and, and go there. Right. I definitely think that mainstream um, comics are starting to um, apply more styles now than they ever had before, um, especially once they started to integrate. Um, comic book or cartoon franchises as comic books. So, you know, if you pick up x it'll look different than if you pick up Adventure Time. Um, those are very different style books, but they do still qualify now as mainstream ideas, which they may not have before. I think that's something that has come across uh, very differently. Um, and one of the things I'm very pleased to say that, you know, all of us represent a different stylistic take um, in our comic book making. Um, leaning from something that's far more cartooned versus something that's more realistic. Um, we, we do carry an entire gamut of things that um, naturally came to us that, you know, the American industry is only just now starting to adopt at large. Um, and if I can add on to that, I just thought of an example of um, a mainstream comic company trying to play with style, and that is Archie Comics, mm -hmm. which I'm a big fan of. But they had a huge um, fail, st stylistic fail, with their, oh, what was the name of that line? So what they did, they had a name for it, but what they did was they took the characters, I think they were supposed to be more realistic, realistic and big, <laughs> and so they, like for the female characters, they shrunk their waist down, their heads got gigantic, they sort of looked like Bratz characters, and they were horrible, and people hated them. And I think the girls in particular were like, what is this crap? It's just awful <laughs> stories. And the stories changed to much more serious stories and like depressing, my, you know, almost like suicidal, <laughs> just awful. Yeah, that's, not, that's not, not, Archie. that's not what you read Archie for, right? right. You're not, you don't want, you don't read Archie, you want to slit your wrist alone, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, right? <laughs> um, and so I think that's an example though of a company that's realizing that, or realized at the point they needed to do something different, but that wasn't it. That, that kind of art and those kind of storylines were not it at all, yeah, but, but they tried. Yeah, I was gonna say that um, another example of that would be um, Marvel Comics has released two volumes of a series called Strange Tales, where they bring in um, some prominent indie-esque, um, if you were to look at that as a style, creators to tell some of their stories. And they're, the storytelling aspects of the art are very different, um, but that is one of their ways of trying to um, bring in another style of comic book storytelling into the mix. Um, but going back to the, the obvious you know, minority um, ethnicity piece of it, um, as minorities, do you feel um, an expectation of representing either yourself or other minorities in your work? I see Bridge is saying yeah. it's one of those funny things. So I feel like yes and no. Mm -hmm. And yes, because I'm conveying, at least so far, and, and, I, and I've got other stuff that I'm working on, as part of my experience of growing up. So part of my, I mean, I can't get out of the fact that I'm a Latina woman, right? I mean, right. It, 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 I am who I am. Um, but I don't like the, I don't like the potential box of, oh, she is a Latina and therefore all of her work should be, you know, Latina, what does that even mean, right? right. I, if someone asked me, at a, we had this big gala thing where I had an exhibit of my paintings, and someone asked me, because I do a lot of like sunscapes and treescapes and a lot of like really bright colors, and someone said, oh, so where are your Latino pieces? And I said, what? <laughs> 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 How do you answer that question? So, On the walls. <laughs> did you miss the exhibit? <laughs> I know you, you so have. so yeah um, <laughs> the thing that 
that peeves me the most about, especially older mainstream comics, is for me, uh, and and I'm gonna piggyback off what you said. I don't know if anybody noticed, but I'm an African American. <laughs> so, Say what? Yeah, yeah. No. Don't let that out. Don't let that out. Oh man, I didn't see you at the last meeting. However, <laughs> <laughs> however, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, I grew up in a very mixed town in Virginia, Hampton, Virginia. So when I read books that had people that looked like me, for whatever reason, every one of their names started with black. <laughs> and the books were in color. <laughs> so you could tell he was black. No, you couldn't. You and so not. I didn't want to read that book. And, and to this day, we're talking about it, and, and I hate any character that refers to himself or has anyone call him black, or or I'm um, Asian Steve, or you know, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. Obviously, we know what you are. So on, on on the other page, even if your name doesn't absolutely tell who you are, if your costume is in your country's color. And then your sidekick is in his country's color. That, come on, I mean that, that's a little over the top. Superman does not have to wear red, white, and blue for you to know he's American because he's not representing America, is he? He simply lives in America, but he helps people in other countries. Now, if 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 I'm an African man and I wear the red, black, and yellow, am I only supposed to help people of African descent? You know, one one major character that I really, really hated was when in the Superman Death series, they gave they gave a black man um, an idea to help out, and he, he lived in the projects. The other characters that, that became of Superman were all white, right? They got powers. This guy made a suit out of metal, which was fine. He made a hammer to help himself out. That was great. But they named him Mark Henry. John Henry. John Henry. John Henry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mark Henry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, I mean, they, they named him John Henry. Yeah, John Henry Irons. Who, who, who historically he was, was a still black guy. And he, yeah, that's what he did. And, and, and he hammered things. Yeah. And it pissed me off. It really did. As, as a black creator, a black artist. Um, and anytime you see a, a a book like that, for me, it's painful. It, it's very emotional for me. I don't I don't need that type of stereotype, you know, for me to, to, to feel better about myself. And I don't I don't feel that my son or, or my friend's children, or even my white friends, to look at that type of thing and 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 say, okay, well that's okay. For society in this day and age. Gotcha. <clears throat> I was gonna say, uh, I don't feel an expectation to represent my skin color in the book. I feel an expectation to represent what's happening in the world. Um, uh, from making comic books, working with Rand, working with Victor, working with the people that I have worked with, um, and being a comic book fan and movie enthusiast as I am, the thing that I notice is that when you relate things and ground it around reality as much as possible, surround people with things that they're familiar with, that's what makes a good story. That's what makes a comic book a good movie. Um, one of my biggest gripes, even though it's not a comic book, uh, this TV show called Friends. These people live in the heart of New York City. Um, where are your Latino, Black, and Asian friends in New York City? I'm not knocking your friendship. That's great. But you don't have one Asian, Black, or Latino person come over for dinner? Like, y'all don't have friends outside. Not I'm just saying. Not even in the building. Not even in the building. <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't even have any steps. The same criticism. That exact same criticism as being leveled at girls, Lena Dunham's girls. That exact same criticism. Oh wow, that's yeah. that's a that's a big series right now. Yes. Surprising. Wow. So, okay. and that's my thing. I'm just like, um, which is one of the reasons why my book is expected in Columbus, because you know I want people to see those landmarks. I want people to see them in the situation. And when I watch Friends, yeah, it's funny, 
But then in the back of my head, I'm like, dang, man, I could have had one Latino. I don't know. But, um, but I have the expectation to show have variety. Again, the time of the first question. I want people to read my books. I want you to get attached to it with the fact of seeing. I feel like that could be me, or I feel like that could be my kid, or I feel like that's my best friend. Like, I want you to be able to relate to it. It's kind of hard to relate to something when you don't see when you don't see you in it. We don't see anything that you're familiar with in it, except for what society is telling you. Hey, this is what it is. This is how the system is supposed to be. This is how our story is. This is how important in Lower New York is. Well, I was going to say that sometimes uh, I come from a, a strange place because most of the children that I'm working with are, um, I would say, a large portion of them are African Americans, and sometimes I forget or I don't, I don't think about. I just, I just kind of do. So what I'm writing from real life experiences a lot of times. So I'm just recreating, and I have to remember, like, where everybody else is coming from. So sometimes opens my eyes up, but it kind of, like, for example, one of the things that, with Mr. I Didn't Do It, I started that, I don't know, probably five or six years ago, because I had a classroom full of boys that if I didn't put that down in comics, I was going to be somewhere else, because <laughs> that was a tough one, a really tough class full of boys that were just, wow. And so, you know, I, all these antics that they did, you know, I went ahead and I comic it into this cartoon. And I was looking through it the other day, and I thought, wow, it doesn't, if I, if I give those to my kids now, it does look very stereotypical. Even though all I was doing was completely drawing, I, you know, I kind of put all those boys and what they did into one child, but I was modeling it after that child. And I look at it now, and I think, gosh, that kid looks really stereotypical in my you know, with the long chain and the sagging pants and those really big t-shirts, but that's what he was at right. the time. So now I'm working on updating and changing it, making it different, but also representing myself, you know, I'm not going to change who I am. I learned a long time ago that, you know, I have to be who I am. And, you know, I'm a white female. That's how it is. But it doesn't mean that I can't understand or relate or hear your story and try to to get it and get it in there. Yeah. That's that's a that's a great statement. Um, there has been a little bit of a um, little internet hubbub um, over the last few weeks. Uh, journalist Joe Hughes um, for Comics Alliance did a piece um, how there are a lack of minority uh, writers in the mainstream right now, um, and some people do feel like that's one of the reasons that you know these particular. Um, people of particular backgrounds don't have the necessary skills to relate to the stories or to tell stories of other cultures. Um, and that, that might be also, on the flip side, why so many characters are um, carrying a, a stereotype about their ethnicity or background of some sort um, when they are created because the, the, the current writing staff, they don't have the counterculture ideas. We have uh, characters like Luke Cage, um, who is definitely a black exploitation as character. Um, though black is not in his name, it might as well be. <laughs> I mean, like, well, he actually had a catchphrase of sweet Christmas. But you know, like, when you read it, it's like, sweet Christmas. Like, you know, it's supposed to hear it. You know, it's not just like, oh, sweet Christmas. But, you know, it's not a grim. There's a certain way that it's you know, So that's a. Um, you know, there's, there's a cultural wall there that seems to be the, the promoted idea of why these things don't necessarily uh, cross over. But I like what you're saying, that um, once you, you really tap into the heart of it, those things really don't exist. There is no reason for us not to be able to, to go across the world because there are those common base things. Um, the next question does kind of go back a little bit. Um, invitation versus exploitation, when they do try to um, integrate these these other cultures, other ethnicities, other types of people. Um, you know, do you feel that it that it is um, that open doorway, or is it you know exploitation? Uh, and can you give an example of one that worked? That where the question just got hard right there. What worked? Oh, mm, I don't know. So I have, a, I have an example of uh, invitation versus exploitation that is sometimes inviting and sometimes exploitative. <laughs> And that is with the Hernandez brothers. Okay. So Gilbert Hernandez, um, uh, Jamie. Jamie Hernandez, thank you. Um, and, and occasionally Mario 
and that is that in, in that, so the Hernandez brothers were, and I remember being an undergrad and this being somewhat inaccessible to me just because um, although I would go to the comic shop and I'd see it, I knew if I took that home I was going to be in trouble, right? So I was attracted by the covers that had women who were sort of nor more normal size or maybe a little bigger, different sizes, and that was very attractive. But then I would open it and there's you know some sex stuff that if my parents were to pick that up, and, and I was a commuter student, so uh, that was not that was not going to be okay. And so I, when I was when I was an undergrad, I, I didn't explore that because I didn't explore their comics because of that because I was like ah, I'm gonna get in trouble. And so, so coming back to them later as a, as an adult and as a as a scholar working on comics, um, I've been reading their stuff and their standalone stuff, and I find some of it is just so wonderful and so inviting and, and you see different body types and you see so many very strong female characters and LGBT characters and it's great. And then you see, you know, characters with like gigantic, you know, breasts and and, 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 and all the yeah, like Luba. And Luba not only has gigantic boobs, but she's got, you know, a waist this big and I and I I think her story is very compelling, but at the same time I'm sort of repelled by it. And so, and they, so they, there's a lot of, maybe not a lot, but there is a kind of sexual exploitation that, that runs through it. And I've had conversations with folks about this, about having that dual, like, I love it, I hate it. I love it, love it, I kind of hate it. I love it, but I hate it, you know? And, and it's constant. And I, I think that also makes their work very dynamic, because I, I kind of like that push and pull, and it makes for interesting conversation. I think that's a really good example of where okay. they're, they're working on multiple levels. Okay. Which was, uh, oh, yeah. You just know that. Uh, <laughs> the, the, biggest, the biggest thing that I, I can think of right now is when I was in high school, and don't tell anybody um, how old I am, uh, with Milestone Comics branched off of DC Comics with an idea that was, that was great for the time. It was, let's give minorities their own books. We're not going to let them hang out with Superman and <laughs> <laughs> But we'll have black writers, black artists, black creators do their own thing over there. And they can hang out in the projects. <laughs> but it was, it was, for the main part, uh, uh, an enormous fail. However, anyone in here that watches television that, that reads any books knows of a character named Static Shock. Static Shock started over there. He did not live in the projects, however. His friends were Caucasian and Latino and, and these things, and he lived in a neighborhood much like my own. I bought every one of those issue number ones. The only number two I bought was that one. I completely hated them all, <laughs> except that one. Um, I think that was, matter of fact, I believe, except for very recently in some of the Justice League um, uh, series, um, the only character that has shown up in the mainstream book as, as, as a true mainstream, not like a crossover or anything like that. Um, they, they got a couple of yeah, he, he's, he's done really well. Appreciate that, yeah, that one. He definitely is one of the few to integrate over like yeah. that with uh, his own cartoon series on WB. Yeah, and he's actually in the, in the new one now. Is he? Is he? Okay. Yeah. And I know they did put some of the other characters from the new series is Young Justice, which just got canceled, unfortunately. Uh -huh. But they did bring in. Huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> sorry. Oh. Sorry. But they did integrate um, at least two other characters from the Milestone universe. Um, Icon, which is a black Superman character, and his uh, sidekick Rocket. Um, so, yeah, th those are some of the few that have been able to transition over um, from their original standing. Um, that's a difficult question that she comes. I'm sorry. Gets my brain I'm sorry. angry. Um, because when you look at a lot of things that's been introduced in the mainstream comics with the different cultures, different ethnicities and stuff, uh, they're all expectations. Okay. <laughs> they're all trying to buy tickets and say, hey, all right, let's go get this market. Okay, let's go get this market over here now. Um, but then, 
you kind of got to take it with a grain of salt and say, uh, they may be doing it for the wrong reasons, but maybe somebody in that office has the right idea of let's start integrating this in. Um, and you get it, um, you buy it, and they're trying to push it. I know Red hates the Black Panther. Um, <laughs> I, I actually like. Yeah, the Black Panther is actual cat. It's fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Black Panther is actual cat. It's fine. Okay, that one's fine. Okay, that Black Lightning. Black Lightning okay. is, is, is complete garbage. Ridiculous. <laughs> I know Black Panther was thrown in there as someone to to go against Captain America and again to get that black character out there um, for the black community. And I think it was kind of a bit of a joke in the beginning, but in the last maybe eight years, they started taking Black Panther very serious. Uh, they got a really good writer on them, um, got a really good artist, John Romina Jr., one of my favorite artists, on his book. And, and you come to find out, Black Panther has looked Captain America a couple yes, times. Yes, he has. The country <laughs> of where he comes from, Wakanda, has never been conquered. They are the most, if I'm correct, the most technologically advanced city on our planet. Think country as a country, whole. The country yeah. as a whole. And then you get to reading the stuff, it's just like, all right, Marvel, give me another one. Right. You, no. you, you hit the, no. you hit the <laughs> point. You did this right. The writing's good, the art's good, and you, you've been treated with the character. And pretty much Black Panther's gone up against everybody. He's smart, he's strong, he can hang with any of the superheroes. Um, he was on the Avengers for a little bit, and you're like, yeah, all right, you did that good. Now, come on, give me some more. Do some more good. Don't just put it out there just because, you know, comics have a trend of following whatever's going on in our work in our world real life wise and they'll relate a story or they'll get characters or they'll modify characters to fit that motif at that time. And I just think they need to take more time with it, like they did with Black Panther or like they did with the Miles Morales character. If you I believe that when you have the money that Marvel does now that they're owned by Disney. If you put the right money into the advertisement, right? If you put the right money into the advertisement and your creative team, you can make anything successful. Um, that's why the Black Panther is successful. That's why the Spider, the new Black Spider-Man book is successful because they did a proper advertising campaign. They got an artist that they knew the vast majority of people would love. They put a good writing staff together on that. I mean, Brian Michael Bendis oversaw it. I don't know if everyone knows who that is, but he's pretty much writing every single book in Marvel Comics. <laughs> um, that's just his life now. He's an Ohio native from Cleveland. Yes, he is. Um, so, if they put the time, if they, if, if Marvel and DC and Image and all these com companies wanted to, to really sit down and come up with these characters for everyone, they can. It's just that. The market or the society they're in right now is telling them oh, all we need to do is put out one every six years or one every three years for them to make them happy. <laughs> one that we can really, really put some time and invest into, and then they'll be good. They'll go away. Let's go. Let's keep putting out these uh, Disney goofy money. Goofy money. <laughs> goofy money. <laughs> goofy. <laughs> Coffee. Can you throw any out there? Well, it, considering that you know the majority of everything I do, I, and I got involved in in all of this because of literacy. Um, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm a Wonder Woman fan and everything. But, uh, but the reality was I didn't even understand that it existed. And um, when I did get out there, all I saw was the exposure. I can't, can't put that out. I can't put that out. So I really had to dig. Luckily, I was able to get into a lot of the graphic novels, and there I was able to find a lot of things that we're inviting. Um, but as far as that goes, I would have to agree all the way across the board. It is really hard to find something that is not exposure because I would love to find more inviting. Even even the stuff that's not my genre, mm -hmm. you know, I've got to work on everybody and think about all of those kids and, you know, I want them to be exposed to good things. And that, that's the way it's going to change, actually, is to get them thinking differently, them to be a different media. And they would in turn create different things, you think? Well, they or? would want different things. Okay. So if you start exposing them and you start uh, getting those things out there and then, hey, I don't I don't want to look at that. Right. Just like, you know, I think that the, with like the LGBT, I think it's less of an issue with a lot of our children than it is probably with generations. Right. You know, it was all secret. Right. All the stuff I found in here. Um, now 
kind of like, who cares? You know, so I think that that has been changed just simply by them being exposed and going, wait a minute, these people are saying this thing. Right. But who cares? Um, and I think that's how we can do you all think that one of the issues that would play into the exploitation is the spectacle that's made behind those changes in characters where, um, what was it, last year it was, it was announced, if you will, that the Earth 2 Green Lantern, Alan Scott, was gay. But if they had just done it, it wouldn't have been a big deal. It would have been something that, you know, is not sensationalized, it's just, oh, okay, you know, it's just something else to accept about the story and you just keep moving with it. But once they try to draw attention to that part, that that's what makes it more exploitational or um, is, is there even room for that? I feel that it was, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to just jump in, but I do feel like it's exploitational because, you know, you know, I'm going simply by, you know, what I see. And I'm not hearing a lot of my kids asking for a green lantern. Uh, they might say, oh, I call me, I want you to get you know, Superman, or I want you to get Spider-Man, or Batman, or I want you to get this or that. And am I hearing Green Lantern? Well, now you see that it's it's becoming, you know, more acceptable. It's it's a hype. It's the, the cool thing to do. So let's make him gay. Now we got a whole bunch. Oh, I want that. Right. You know, whereas if you'd have just done it, nobody probably would have even have noticed it. Um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think marketing is obviously a big issue, right? We all, everyone wants, you, you want people to buy your comics. And I think a, a, an example of the sort of marketing, potentially exploitive, but at least they did something, <laughs> example is going back to Archie Comics. In their introduction of Kevin Keller, their first outwardly gay character. So they don't say he's the first gay character, they say he's the first outwardly gay character. But so they they introduced him not in Archie Comics, the, the mainstream Archie Comics, but in Veronica, right? In, in, a, in an episode, I think it was called Isn't It Romantic? So he interacts with Jughead, who, you know, rumor has it that maybe he's gay, who knows, we don't know, right? Um, and so um, they they tested the waters first, so they weren't they weren't sure how they would go over, but how that would go over. But people were like, it's about time. <laughs> like, why is this a big deal? Why is this even an announcement? Just do it. Just introduce the character. And once they saw that that people weren't offended or, or really even that moved by it, then he got his whole line right. He's, now there are Kevin Keller comics. There's a whole line of. But interestingly enough, Kevin Keller is male, blonde hair, blue eyes. So they're like, well, we made him gay, but we didn't want to go too far. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. I think uh, when they make announcements of shoutouts like that, where with the Green Lantern thing, he's coming out, he's gay. Um, I think that is exploitation of it, and now at that point, I don't think you care about that, that, that bunch of people. You're just trying to do it, just trying to get their money. Robert Kirkman, he's one of my one of my writer, one of my favorite writers. Uh, I like how he writes his book because in Invincible, they constantly have two or three stories going on at once. Um, they'll have the mainstream story that's going on in the book, but two, maybe three pages of that same issue, they have a sub story that's starting to build up. So even if you did something like that to where um, let's help people out, let's help them understand what it's like to come out when you're dealing with these type of issues, when the world is saying that you should be normal, why don't we do a build up of a backstory where this person is secretly going to know, go live out their life the way they want to, but in the public they hide it. So there could have been a story arc developed with this Green Lantern character where this was going on behind the scenes, but through the main pages he was still Green Lantern, and then two or three pages he was Green Lantern okay. And then that story could have just came out, you just would have had your readers read it. I think you get more um, acclaim for something when somebody else discovers it and then they review it and they say, wow, that, that just happened. I didn't know that was going to happen in the book. We were looking at this build up and what it was leading to. And I think comics, I mean, I'm a huge comic fan. I think comics are making enough money, but I think they're so thirsty for income that they have to keep rapid firing out. Here's the next big event, here's the fall event. Here's a summer of it. Oh, this character's turning gay. All right, we got the Black Spider-Man. Here comes that announcement. They're so worried about making the announcement to keep people's interest when all you gotta do is write solid stories. 
there's enough comic book fans in the community, in the world out here to where they're going to get that book, faithfully read it, and they're going to put up a review, and someone else is going to see that review. Like, what happened to like doing things like that? Like, I used to hear about books, like, I hear about a book from Victor, like, you know, this is what's going on, and then I go pick up that book. Or else I'd read a, um, a review on comicbookrelated.com, and it make me interested in what's going on. But they're so caught up in the fact that we gotta have something, gotta have this. Let's get our index cards out, our postcards out for this summer's event to let everybody know this is happening. So it doesn't seem like there's any care in it for that reader. It's just like, we're just trying to do another gimmick to get your money. I think uh, one of the most successful um, uses of, of ethnicity in comics that way um, was uh, Shadowhawk. Um, we're talking years ago from the image line done by Jim Valentino where it was um, finally revealed, like I think issue 25 even, I mean, we're going two years into the series, that the main character Shadowhawk was in fact African American. It was something that we didn't know and the way that it was revealed was there was a copycat uh, vigilante who was going out and crippling um, people of minorities thinking that that was what um, Shadowhawk, the character, was establishing it. He was going after minorities because they were inherently bad, inherently wrong, and so he was taking up this mantle. And it was revealed um, when Shadowhawk confronts this guy, like, you know, this guy's like, yeah, I'm getting the, I'm getting the black guys, I'm taking care of all of them. And he's like, really? You think that's what I'm about? Takes off his mask and goes, no, I'm black. Why would I, why would you think that? And so it was one of the, the, the few and great um, moments to represent, you know, uh, a sudden, you know, shock and reveal, but it fit within the story. It wasn't about, you know, gaining new sales because it wasn't something that was, you know, oh, we're gonna find out the truth that he's a black guy. We didn't know who he was, so that was the whole point. Was, you know, here is the big reveal, fits well into the story, and that's the way that that turned out, which I thought was really cool. Um, so, with the sense of diversity and all the things that we have, how well do you guys think that Columbus has um, allowed you to showcase that sense of diversity? In your, in your comic booking? Has, it, has there been a great response to it, or um, do you feel like it's kind of, eh? What's your, what's your thoughts there? So I'm really lucky because I'm at OSU. We have a cartoon library. I work with um, Jared Gardner, who's on my dissertation committee. I have amazing narrative theory people on my committee who are like, go. Oh, well, you know, finish, but go, <laughs> do, do whatever. And, um, I don't think that that is the case everywhere. I think that there are, speaking as, a, as an academic now, I think that there are still places, universities, that are resisting using comics in the classroom, that are resisting comics as an academic enterprise, um, whether it's creating comics or studying comics. So I, I feel like I couldn't be in a better place. Even being from San Francisco, my family is there. I'm really happy that I'm here and, and I have access to I mean, the, the comic library. It's just like, oh, and it's moving in the fall and I can't wait. And so um, I, I think this is the, the best place for me. Gotcha. I think it's pretty, uh, I think I'm pretty happy here. Uh, I chose to stay down here after I came from Cleveland. I went to the Cleveland School of Arts and one of my conversations I had with my art teacher, or rather, his speaking down to me, us comic books were not art. I knew at that moment, as soon as I graduated, I needed to <laughs> make <in> the situation. <laughs> um, and then to come down here and go to CCAD and for them to openly embrace it, and like, first year, we'll do a comic book, we'll pay for the publishing. That's art. You go to art school. Your teacher said that? Yeah. Yeah, he did. <laughs> um, but I think uh, the melting pot that is Columbus, the variety of people here, helped me out so much. I don't think I'd be reading any of the books that I came up with if I wasn't here. I don't think I would understand comics to the degree that I, I understand them now. And that's solely because of the people and community that's in Columbus. The art environment is so much more crucial here than in Cleveland. I mean, Cleveland don't get me wrong. Cleveland does have a strong art community, um, but it's more industrial design, car design type of thing. But for what I what I like and what I want to do, Columbus is a spot for me right now as I develop my own comic books. <laughs> um, as, as, as a, as a, what I consider a pure artist, um, as far as me not being a writer or anything else. <laughs> Um, you do great, don't I, say that. Not comic book stuff, but um, I think being behind the scenes, I don't 
<coughs> get the luxury of outwardly seeing the results of what I've done, mainly because it's either for someone else, uh, my freelance work, and, and if they if they um, put it out there, they hear the accolades or, 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 or downfalls or, or bad reviews, and I, I've seen a few, which are fine. I, I, I like the good and the bad, but um, as, as a whole, I believe from what I hear, um, Columbus is, is, is uh, accepting what I've done and what I do uh, fairly well, but um, I get closed up in my work. You know, I, I, don't, I don't go out and, and uh, promote my own work at any point in time on my own. I, I, don't, I don't have to. I, I suppose I can. But um, you like to let it, work it, for itself? It, it's 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 not my place. I don't I don't want people to really see my face as okay. Here's my work. <coughs> okay, you know my work is my work. You know and and when you see it, I want you to look at my work and not worry about who I am, unless you really want. To. Hey, you want to like be involved yeah, in that? Yeah, I, I want you to look at the work first, and you know right. don't don't okay. say oh well. This guy is, is black, or you know, this guy's a white guy. I want you to look at my work and say, I, I really dig this artwork. Who did it? Who in this room did it? After you see it, you know, don't look at me like, oh, what do you do? Huh? I don't know. Go over there. And, and <laughs> <laughs> it's over there. You know, pick out which one you like the best, and, and I'll tell you if it's me or not. Um, but I like Columbus. Columbus has, has a huge um, art community. Um, much bigger than Virginia, especially from where I'm from. Um, I'm here. I like it. Me draw. <laughs> draw a lot. Um, I'm going to say, especially coming from a, a completely different aspect, the whole reason that I even really got introduced into this area is because I had classrooms and classrooms full of kids, primarily boys, that were not reading that were not interesting, interested in what I was giving them, even if it was an adventure story or a boy story, and I'm like, I have to do something else, you know? And, and you know, I thought, oh, maybe I should throw some comic books in, but I just didn't even know what to do with it. And I actually started studying it through Ohio State. I had been, and I was offered that through Columbus City Schools to go there and to learn about it. And I mean, once you start, you're hooked. And I'm like, it's like, it's like Facebook or something. <laughs> you know, and it's awesome and then you know for what I do I'm not doing anything to be published and I haven't even completely even considered any of that because all I'm concerned with is that just that reading and the storylines and God please give me good storylines you know and some clean ones <laughs> but uh, it is I mean Jeff Smith is you know he's a Columbus um, artist and writer, and he is what I originally, is the first couple of books I looked at, I went, ah, this is fluffy comic stuff, I got it, it's good. And then, I, you know, I got the whole thing. I'm reading, and I'm reading, and I can't put it down. I'm like, wait a minute, there's a whole journey in here. Wait a minute, this is really good literature. And um, primarily, I do run into a lot of people that are promoting the graphic novel, the comic books, um, and are, are becoming, it's becoming more acceptable. Libraries are starting to be able, school libraries are starting to put them more in. Um, so it is becoming a bigger area, but I think Columbus is a really good area to come to, uh, for what I know. You know, I've been exposed to a lot of stuff because of Columbus. Um, those were pretty much all of my questions. I definitely hope that you guys were entertained by these things. And if you guys have any questions of your own, we are definitely open to them. Does anyone? Yes. I, I loved your final wrap-up question of how do you feel about the Columbus community, artistic community now. But uh, as a guy who, who's working hard to try to promote things and grow this community, what would you like to see the Columbus uh, comic book creator community start to do? I like to see more things like this. Because <clears throat> in all honesty, uh, this is the first time I ever met you. Mm -hmm. Did not know anything about you until Victor um, introduced this idea of me coming here. I would like to see more events like this because this is awesome. This is a very good turnout. This, 
I didn't know this gallery was here. I just know this place was a movie theater. Right. So to walk in here, see comic book art framed, um, see uh, we got over 15 people here in this small space, here attentive and listening. Uh, yeah, more things like this. Um, obviously, I'm going to give you my email information and stuff, but reaching out to the uh, to independents like me and Randy. Right here, right here, so. I mean, because like people like me have a really big mouth. I'm not, I'm not kidding, but I'm serious because I, and I do not shut up. And when, you know, like we're all buying for the $10,000 off NBC guy, like, and that will be graphic novels because we, they're mine all stolen. I mean, and that's awesome because if a book's stolen, it's read. And if they're not reading it, somebody else is reading it. But all we're buying is graphic novels. And I have influence. And, you know, comic books, I have influence because I have a big mouth. Um, and we have money. We have money for that kind of stuff. So I'm saying, hey, this is good. Um, personally, you know, as an educator, you know, I, I'm all about expressing yourself and do that. Give me some clean stuff, just so I don't end up on the news or anything. Um, but and those children, when they're exposed, they're in love with it. They become your consumer. I send my kids to the Laughing Ogre. I send my kids to different places to get, and they, they go, even when they're not necessarily what you consider high income. You know, they're going because that's what they want. That's what they want for their birthday. That's what, you know, some might be little, but it can get bigger. Just go to the school, come out, with us. we want you. And to um, piggyback on what you said, um, we need to support each other in this community. Because uh, no one else is going to advertise for us but us. So we need to figure out or find out who we are, put ads for our comic books in our comic books when we're at events, do events together. Do If I do an event, I need to network with you to get you at the event. Find people that have big mobs. Um, There's 5,000 <laughs> teachers that I run my mouth with, you know. Right. You never um, know. I constantly talk but, about you guys. But that's what Marvel Comics and DC has. I mean, they're already up there, but when they were on the ground up building up, they had a network of people that they went through to ask for money to put them here, or where would be a good spot for us to be at. And we need to create that same type of network. And I get that to chime off this man right here, because uh, it's something he's been saying and preaching for years, for years. And he's getting an opportunity to do that within the last three years to really push that and show that it can be done. Um, I think. Some people just need to get off of the hating motif, and we all just need to work together and make an independent community here in the Columbus Network and push it out and just all work together to make it happen. I think also we need more workshops. This is how we met, right? At, at the Matt Madden workshop when, when he was here. And I think we need more opportunities to see behind the scenes, like how do you create a comic? How, does, how do you develop a story? What makes a good story? Not everyone understands the labor that goes into <laughs> oh, that's true. the right. creation of a comic. And I think that lots of folks would um, be really receptive to you know, small workshops, different kinds of workshops, art workshops, story workshops, um, you know, panel, panel development, or I don't know, making that up. But, you know, um, opportunities to like come together and make the art together mm -hmm. and learn how, because the way I make a comic you know, it's like whatever, versus um, how someone else makes a comic. Digital comics are very different from everything that's done all by hand, right? And the only way that we can learn that is, is by the networking, but also I think workshops, I'm, all, I'm always about you know, teaching opportunities and learning opportunities. I would love to see more of those. I definitely think that that will be on the menu, um, especially voicing that. Um, one of the things I do think is very funny, like you were saying that, um, there are so many of us, but we don't all know each other or know that we know each other. Um, we had that experience um, at Independence Day last year where um, Ken introduced me to Michael Nino. And I was like, well, I've actually known Michael for some years. And so it's one of those things where it's like, well, he didn't know that. And then in turn, however long you might have known Michael, I didn't know that you knew him. So here we are, three people that have been in circulation around each other, but just never quite brought it in to say, hey, Oh, you, you're this guy and you're that guy. Okay, well let's let's do something. So I definitely think that that's a that's a big thing for us to do more things like this um, to put us all together in the same room and see what else uh, we can do. Any any other questions? Yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It was 
Me? <laughs> Go ahead. Go for it. Okay. Uh, I wanted, I'm sorry, what's your name again? My name? Yes, Teresa. Teresa, uh, it's very funny that you brought up um, the Luba situation in the Hernandez comics because my husband and I had a discussion about that just like two nights ago because he was looking at, a, you know, at, at some of the you know, depictions of Luba and he's like, do you find this exploitative resources? <laughs> and I, you know, and I was like, to an extent, yes, but also I have to realize that I'm dealing with somebody who is running this whole story on, you know, a, there's a certain level of fantasticness that is going with it, so I can't really say that it's malicious. Yeah. And, you know, and judging, you know, from the other things that both the, both of the brothers have written, it's not, you know, it, uh, you know, I don't take it offensively as it being sexist, but there is a very funny panel that I read one time where Gilbert, you know, is sitting at his desk and Luba is pounding him on the head, <laughs> telling him, you know, we just stop this, please? I'm having a hard enough time finding blouses that fit. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think that he is aware of it, and I think that he is, you know, in that panel he was trying to, you know, point out to women particularly. Yeah, that, but know, they're aware. aware of it. Yeah, I you think know. there's also, what I like about Luba, one of the things I like about her is that her physicality is very much integrated into her storyline, mm -hmm. right? And into her history and her origin and all of that. So it isn't just that she's this character with big boobs and a small waist, and then you know we move on like, oh, let's look at her and and critique her or love her or hate her or whatever. It's that she is that part of her is very much part of who she is. It's very much part of the telling of her story and the telling of the stories related to her, you know, her sister and, and other characters. Um, throughout the storyline, so on that level, I appreciate that very, very much. So it's, it, it is, it takes away that element of, well, not takes it away completely, but the sort of exploited element that we were talking about earlier, to know that there is that awareness. And I haven't seen that that panel that you mentioned, but it <laughs> sounds great. I'll make a copy of it. Yeah, that would be great. It um, kind of fits into uh, the, at least the self awareness of it. Um, on a more mainstream side, there's a series called Battle Chasers, and there's a character <coughs> called, uh, named Red Monica, and she is busty beyond reason. Uh, but at the same time, but yeah, like literally, <laughs> yeah, right, that's not a, that's not a joke. Um, but the the thing is, is that they are um, artificially gravitated with their buoyancy, and it was like, I mean, literally, like it's up here and then perfectly, you know. Supported, um, the, despite the fact that she's wearing like boost heels. But the creator, Joe Matarera, he did that on purpose. It was this statement about how oversexualized you know, female characters are in the comic book world. And um, she would often use that to her advantage. You know, those were um, booby tricks or tricks that she would use all the time. You know, weapons. Trap. It was tricks too. It was some tricks. Some there. booby traps. There was some tricks. I didn't want to be all just grabbing about it, but, um, but yeah, I mean that was that, that was something that he played off around with too. And he was, you know, often said to, you know, been a big person to, you know, uh, oversexualize a character. But here he did it as a commentary of saying, okay, yes, this does get ridiculous, and this is how ridiculous it can be. So that's another, you know, place where it kind of. Um, hit home where you know the, the artist or creator is like, yes, you're right, it is it is kind of outlandish. So that was that's a great one. I just hold on Michael. Yeah. I, I have more of like kind of a general question. As far as your first issue from like how long did that process take to from conception to Yeah Mike, how long did it take from yeah, conception? What? Before the first issue of Hot Shot came out. I'll say that like I got some inside <laughs> my feet or something. Like that. Ask, like, how long did that take? Something. How long did that take? How long did that take? I mean, that's all I'm saying. That was written in what? Like, everybody, everybody just lean back because this is gonna take one. <laughs> the first issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. First issue took like two years to do. Two um, years. After you realize. All right, all right, all right. That's fair. I'll give first you off, I'll give you let me back up. Let me back up a little. I give you two years. This is this is. And Victor's a good friend, so <laughs> I expect my friends to be honest with me. That's perfectly fine, because I'm going to be honest with him. I wrote a story for Hot Shot, and Victor's like, oh, man, this is pretty cool. You know, looked at the characters, like, oh, he's a great little blue guy. Okay, um, <laughs> what, look, this is what I'm going to do, because I like you. I'm going to write up a little sample of something, get you give me some coaching and direction on how to write a story. Um, and maybe you can use it in your philosophy classes, I don't know. Um, so. I'm like, all right, that's cool, because I know I can't write. So uh, Victor takes this story, it's about 
two weeks go by and I get a monolith. This <laughs> thing. It was right? like that bad. It was. So I get it and I flip through it. I mean, it's like an academic book. It's got full six issues of Hot Shot in it, dissecting everything <laughs> apart, looking at it like, all right, when you take a character at this moment in the story, you should do this. I'm like, man. And I'm reading like, yeah. yeah. So you know why I ignored all the academic aspects, right? <laughs> you know why I ignored all that? And I was like, Victor, this is a good story. You should write Hot Shot. Now, Victor's not going to admit it. He did all this on intentions for me to ask him. I to did write not do that. That was the whole that. setup. I did That's not the do that. That's the of what he goes to. my genius. So we get the book, write it. I start drawing the book. Yes, it was a two-year process. And I kept starting it over. Kept starting it over. Kept starting it over. So Victor comes over to my house one day and looks like, so how far you got on the book? I'm like, I'm on seven pages into it. He's like, all right, stop. <laughs> I know what you're doing. I understand. Like. What I, what I was noticing is that the more and more I drew the book, I was like, all right, well, page eight looks better than page one. All right, so let me go back. Let me go back. Let me go back, because that doesn't look good. And I just wanted this perfect comic book. And what Victor had to get me to understand, and what I had to understand myself, is that the book's not going to be perfect. Um, you just have to get the book out there. You have to show people that you can make a book and put a book out in a timely manner. Um, the artwork's going to improve as the issue's coming up. I just was this real cocky person, and I was at the Columbus College of Art Design on a scholarship, and I was like, I'm going to talk the best freaking material that you've ever seen. And you know, this, and part of the reason was because Marvel Comics, I applied to Marvel Comics three separate times at three different comic conventions. These people, yeah, I'm going to say these people, <laughs> told me, all right, all you got to do is this. Come back. Bang. Next year. Boom. All right, yeah, yeah, I see you fixed this, now do this. Bang. Came back next year. Pulled me off to the side. So, you know, I'm looking at everybody else in line like, yeah, <laughs> this is it, baby. Yeah. Pulls me off to the side. I'm like, all right, hey, with it. What you got? It's like, yeah, this is good. Um, Real good. Yeah, yeah, I see you did this. Um, It's not what Marvel's looking for right now. <laughs> you, so, you ain't going to embarrass me. Um, so, what, what's wrong with it? Um, It's just real. <laughs> that wasn't the word they used. What was it? Urban. Oh, yeah, we are. Oh, that's better. 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 <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you have a very urban style. If you look at our style right now, it's real American. So it's, they look like black people. Okay. So at that point, that's when I decided to venture off into my own comic books. And it's some of the fire that kept having me. All right, now I'm going to redraw, I'm redraw. Because eventually I'm going to be at a point where Marvel Comics asked me to draw a book for them. I'm never going to apply for them again. So you'd be like, no, I'm too urban. I can't do it. Right. <laughs> How much of y'all mean? How much of y'all mean? Yeah. What was the check again? Let me just let me just get the money off. Yeah. Too hard, buddy. Too hard. A little more zero. A little more zero. Yeah, but um, so and then for we got up to issue four out. We were doing a book about every other month. Every two months, getting the book out. Um, then there was another two year hiatus. Had children. Had some things come up. Um, in between issue five, it was about a year, a uh, year and a half to two years before issue six came back out. So now I'm back on it. Issue six just came out last month. Um, I have issue seven coming out at the beginning of, what is that? No, April. April? Yeah, issue seven coming out at the beginning of April, so it's going to be a quarterly book now. I uh, just started the pencils for issue seven. I have my anchor who's fabulous and uh, going to get it in. So it's actually, when it's a timely process and you know, I don't have three girls running around in my hair, touching my toys and touching my games. Um, Cause he's probably, a big kid. Right? Yeah, I am. Layouts and pencils take me about 45 to 60 days to do. Uh, then my anchor, who has these, uh, I'm not saying his job is easy, but he doesn't have to go through the layout process and stuff. <laughs> so it probably takes him about 20 days to ink it. Colorist probably takes about 25 to 30 days to do colors on a full 22 page book. Letterer. Uh, that may be like a two week process for the letter, or two to three weeks, depending on how much dialogue's in it. Then it comes back to me, I put the book all together. That's like about two to three days of getting it print ready. 
send it to the printer, but thanks to Victor, I found another printer that's faster. So that's like a two week process for them to print it and then get the book. So we're looking about three to four months on average. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> Reading into a book in a week, not even lying. I, I can actually promote that because we did it, our first book together, or no, that's our second book together. Second. Um, the Samaritan number one, we had, a, we had a deal. I was like, look, <laughs> I'm gonna get you this table at this show, but we ain't going if you don't have this book done. He was like, really? How much time I got? Just, you got one week. He turned in a book, I was like, oh my God, I didn't think you could do this. Like, seriously, it's one of the best books. This, this book was so good, it's gotten you how many jobs? Maybe three or four. Maybe three or four, off this first issue that he did in a week. So this is why, like, now I'm like, really? Really, dude? Like, you're just gonna bust it out, like, in a week? You're just gonna do greatness in a week? That's what you do? So, I had not eat or sleep, though. I've got I'm demanding. Time. That's what happens. I, I you know, I, I, I work full time, you know, and uh, so my free time is, is, is my hard time. So, you know, when he asked me to do it, and he said, you know, this is this is the time, the time that you have. You know, I, I slumped around for a while. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, true. but I slumped around for a while. You know, I, I, I ride a motorcycle, so sunny days are, you know. Bad. <laughs> so, you know, I get out on the road and I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'll just work out that tomorrow. <laughs> then, tomorrow, the sun comes out again, it's 80 degrees, and I go out. And, you know, so, wintertime is the best time to draw. That's right. But uh, this is not in the wintertime. So, you know, it, it, it's. He still did a great job, though, and that was pencils and inks. Um, any other.